Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day four of vaccine, where we're going to be talking about vaccine development and manufacturing with two members of the University of Arkansas Chemical Engineering faculty. I'm John Treat, Director of Interdisciplinary and Curricular Learning at the U of A Honors College. And on behalf of Dean Linda Kuhn, I want to welcome you to this forum that is open to the public as well as to our enrolled students. Today, we're gonna to be joined by two experts. Uh, Professor Bob Beidel holds a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. He joined the U of A faculty in 1993 and has been a full professor here since 2006. He currently serves as Associate Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. His primary research interests are in the field of biochemical engineering with an emphasis on bioseparation and fermentation and adaptive technology for the disabled. And he has been recognized by the U of A as an outstanding mentor three times, which means a lot to those of us uh, over here who are sending students his way. Secondly, we're joined by Shannon Servas, who holds a PhD from Northwestern. She joined the U of A faculty in 2007 and currently serves as Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering. In her laboratory, she develops peptoid-based biometric materials for use in biomedical and environmental applications. Her laboratory has a particular interest in addressing issues in public health and water availability through the design of novel peptoid-based materials. And the historian has already said more than he knows, but I want to thank you both so much for joining us today. And I turn it over to our two eminently qualified presenters. Thank you so much. So we are forum number four, previously known as Vaccine Development and, Development and Manufacturing. Um, we've retitled that a little bit. We're gonna talk about the role of chemical engineers in vaccine development and manufacturing in particular. There we go, okay. So just a little more on our backgrounds. Um, John did a great job giving us an introduction, but as he mentioned, I'm an associate um, professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering here at the University of Arkansas. I'm also a co-director of the undergraduate research for the University of Arkansas, and I'm a biomaterial engineer. Um, Dr. Beidel is a professor in chemical engineering. He's the associate vice chancellor for research, research and innovation, and he labels himself as a biochemical engineer. So we're gonna go through just a little bit of what do chemical engineers do in the biomanufacturing space? I think probably a lot of people are a little confused about why you have a couple of chemical engineers here talking about all this biomanufacturing stuff. Um, here is just a, a, a few people from our department, alumni from the chemical engineering department at University of Arkansas that, um, that are doing biomanufacturing right now. So um, I'm just gonna mention a few of these people. So Rudra um, and Tang both worked in Dr. Beidel's lab on campus and are currently at um, gene, therapy, gene Therapy Process Development. Is that right, Bob, yep. for Rudra? Yep. Um, and then I can't actually see where Tang is right now. Um, <laughs> fortunately, where is Tang right now, Bob? He's at Takeda in Boston doing all the math behind designing the drugs. Awesome. Um, Elizabeth Pryor is a graduate, got her PhD in chemical engineering at University of Arkansas with Krista Hestikin, and she's currently working at Novozymes in North, North Carolina. And Jennifer Herrera, who didn't have a picture on LinkedIn, so we had to share something um, that came from when she was on campus. Um, she was an undergraduate student in my lab that's currently working at AbbVie. So this is just a small sampling of people from our department that are in biomanufacturing. Chemical engineers are all over biomanufacturing. Um, out in the, in the pharma world and biotech world. So what do chemical engineers do in, in this space? Um, we do a lot of plant operations. So in manufacturing, we, we work on the, the actual plant operations and the plant setup design and keeping things running. Um, we work in R&D. So a lot of chemical engineers are testing the biomolecules and there's part of the process for scaling up. So if a chemist has found something, we work through that process on how to scale it up to a manufacturing scale. And then chemical engineers are frankly all over the place, supply chain everywhere. I'll share a quick story here that's not bio-related, but I, when I joined um, or when I chose chemical engineering as my major, my mom was like, oh, I work with a lot of chemical engineers. I never expected that. My, mom's a, my mom is a Unix systems administrator. She's a computer scientist. <laughs> More than half of her team was chemical engineers. So chemical engineers are a little bit of everywhere in the world, in the um, 
engineering world. And I think, Bob, is this where you were going to take over or am I doing one more here? Who are the first biochemical engineers? That depends on whether you want to talk about beer. You go for it. I mean, I would love to talk about beer, but I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> okay. So um, again, John, thanks for the intro for Shannon and I. Uh, the, whenever we do the, our courses in manufacturing, this is usually a fun little kickoff exercise. And you might think that what I'm going to say for the first for the next five or six minutes is completely unrelated to manufacturing, but this will go back and loop back. So you really will get a sense for what the enabling technology is to do manufacturing and how old it truly is. And I know we've got people on that have microphones that can be turned on because Shannon and I have done remote classes for the last year and a half because of COVID. I'd like to hear somebody give me just, who do you think the first biochemical engineer would be? And that would be a, someone that uses a little bit of knowledge of biology or chemistry to make something. Any thoughts, folks? No answers. Feel free to use the chat if you're uncomfortable unmute, unmuting. Yep. So for lack of an answer, I'll go ahead and give you the answer. And it actually was the Egyptians. And uh, it's kind of funny that whenever we were getting these slides prepared for this, I ran across something that was published on Valentine's Day this year that um, and a dig somewhere in Egypt, they found one of the oldest mass production breweries that they think um, was all of these little crock pots that you'll see. Um, the, the, basically, we usually tout the Egyptians learning how to make beer as literally the first biochemical engineers because they figured out a way to make beer. And you've got this little cartoon that I've got over on the right hand side too, where this person's drawing beer from the bottom of the pot because the cake with the yeast all floats to the top. So just keep in mind that fermentation is the key point for this particular slide. And my mouse will not move. Come on, there we go, okay. So second thing that we usually do when we do this course and this is a shameless plug for the bioprocess engineering class that I teach every other year. Who were the first real biochemical engineers that actually made drugs? Well, this pretty much happened mostly in the 1940s. The folks that made penicillin were literally described as the first people that were involved in manufacturing. And companies that you see in this call out, this is an ACS publication that actually was just um, put out this year. Um, 1940s, 1945, World War II, we needed something to substitute for sulfa drugs because there just was not enough material made in order to deal with all of the injuries and the um, folks that were in, uh, hurt during World War II. And you'll see some names on this thing that should look familiar. Abbott Laboratories, that's actually where Jennifer Herrera, because AbbVie is their contract manufacturing folks nowadays. Uh, Merck, Pfizer, all of these companies with the U.S. Department of Agriculture as sort of the collection point and the ones in charge of the major project tried to figure out how to get penicillin manufactured. Um, this little thing here, I'm sure that you heard David McNabb and Janine Durdick the other day, this is a Petri dish. And this actually is a Petri dish that has got a little bit of a mold growing on it that makes penicillin. The reason why I bring up fermentation as the first enabling technology for manufacturing is because in the 40s, people started to figure out how to go from a Petri dish to a tank to grow the, the, the filamentous fungi that made penicillin. And if you look at this picture of this tank, and again, this is from that ACS publication, you can see a guy standing down here to give you an idea the sense of the scale of this particular operation. This is one of the production vats, courtesy of Merck. And that's in that publication that I would really recommend you guys take a look at from a history perspective. 
Um, that guy that's at the bottom of the tank, I would characterize as a plain biochemical engineer. This is someone that would be involved in manufacturing that probably has a bachelor of science degree. And this person, this he or she, is really involved in what Shannon alluded to a little while ago, that a traditional chemical engineer is worried about designing the equipment that's around the manufacturing of the penicillin. And so there's a guy standing in here and you can actually see quite a bit of engineering pieces. I covered up the pipe by accident with this little schematic over here, but in the previous figure, you'd see that there's a pipe that's feeding this big long donut that's at the bottom. That is a ring that's used to deliver air to the fermenter. You've got a Rushton type impeller that's down here that keeps part of this thing mixed and dissolved air gets broken apart. And then you've got something that looks like the bottom of the Titanic's impeller that's at the top that's later on in here to keep the tank well mixed. You can also see some dimpling along the side of this reactor too. There's a bunch of pipes that are running behind a stainless steel material that can provides the, the heating and the cooling depending on what time of the, what part of the cycle it is during the manufacturing process. So all of this tank and equipment type things is really what, what we would call a traditional chemical engineer looks at. Everybody in this room probably had freshman chemistry and this should look vaguely familiar where you figure out the amount of heat needed just as an example to raise the temperature and you knew the amount of water and the heat capacity of water. The engineering folks do a little bit further and they actually figure out how much area those pipes would have to be needed in order to provide the correct heat transfer requirements. And then we do a lot of characterizations of these tanks that boil down to the properties of the fluids and the solids that's in the tank. For example, in terms of the, this, this is a group that if you actually did the uh, dimensional analysis or you canceled units, you'd see that there's no units here, but this takes into account the viscosity of the fluid, the thermal conductivity of the wall that's being used to transfer heat back and forth, the heat capacity of the fluid, um, all kind of different little equations like these that describe how you build the tank and how you transfer energy back and forth to maintain temperature. So again, traditional plain old chemical engineer. Shannon, your turn. I'm up. Okay, so who are the new biochemical engineers and what do they do? And so let's just be clear, this is, when we say new, we don't mean like in the last couple of years. Um, we mean going back to the 40s <laughs> when penicillin started. Um, so if I can get this to work one more time, there we go, oh, too far. No. There we go. Okay. So here are a few of the people, a few of the chemical engineers, biochemical engineers that are working on COVID vaccines. So on the left-hand side of the slide, we have Nubar Afian and Bill, uh, Bob Langer, sorry, Bob Langer. Um, these two are behind the Moderna vaccine. So Bob Langer, um, his, the, the, much of the mRNA technology that's being used for the vaccine came out of his lab at MIT and Harvard. Um, and then Nubar is the um, co-founder of the company Moderna. Um, Bob Langer actually has his hand in just about everything biochemical engineering. I think Bob, Bob Beidel might agree with me. <laughs> this is just a small inkling of it. He does a lot of tissue engineering work in, in across the whole board, a ton of stuff. Um, so I actually was very surprised to learn he was part of Moderna because this isn't what I traditionally think of him as doing. But his, um, the research originated in his lab, I think a couple decades ago, or not originated, he was part of the, the work going into the development of those vaccines and how they work. Um, Katie Windham is a, um, a chemical engineer out of Auburn University that's at Novavax where they're developing a, another vaccine and they're developing a different type of vaccine than what we already have available in the US. Um, I'm not sure how much David and Janine got into this yesterday, but they're developing a protein-based vaccine. Um, and, and so it'll be exciting to see if we have something on those fronts coming out anytime soon. I know they've done clinical trials, but they've been um, caught up in a lot of the paperwork and the red tape of getting through those trials. 
Um, so this other article that we show here, the UMass Amherst article. So Sari Perry is a chemical engineer at UMass Amherst, and she's working with Karen Helt at, um, sorry, Michigan Tech, um, who I meant to put a picture of on here and I forgot to, but Karen's actually a very good friend of mine. Um, they are actually working on a different side of vaccine. What they're trying to do is stabilize the vaccine so that we no longer need this cold storage that we've had issues with. Um, and, and they're trying to make it so that we don't, they don't even need refrigeration, right? So that we can get people vaccinated anywhere in the world, not just in places where they have access to cold storage or even refrigerators. So all of this to say, you know, the, the job of chemical engineers and all this has been really, as Bob has on the slide here, understanding what are the biochemical things that we need to figure out what is going in the tank, right? How do we get the right stuff in the tank to manufacture at a scale that we can roll this out worldwide? How do we manufacture something that can be used anywhere, rural or not, right? We, we, being in Arkansas, I think we're all aware of the issues with the Pfizer vaccine that's currently requires minus 80 storage, Moderna minus 20, and then Johnson and Johnson, which I think is just refrigerated if I'm not mistaken, um, or at least has less um, storage requirements on it. We, we've seen how that affects what vaccines are available and where. And so I think it's important, um, you know, moving forward, chemical engineers are going to have a major role in making sure that these vaccines are usable everywhere in the world and helping us get control of this through vaccination overall. So we are going to make you be interactive today. I'm sorry for that. I know that everybody likes to stay behind their, their black screen with their white lettered name on it, but we're going to make you get a little uncomfortable. We're going to do, we're calling this a group exercise. This is a small enough group. We can each work on this on our own. Um, what we would like you to do is get online and find your favorite vaccine, <laughs> whatever vaccine you want it to be, except here are the rules. Um, you need to find the name of the vaccine or the disease that it's vaccinating against, the manufacturer of the vaccine, Find some sort of product brochure. If it's used in the US, I promise you the FDA has an amazing product brochure um, that you can um, use. Make sure the ingredient list is there. It should be if it's the FDA brochure. Put the name of the vaccine and the manufacturer into the chat box and you can't use anything that's from SARS-CoV-2. So if you guys, we're gonna give you five to 10 minutes to do that. We'll watch the chat and see how quickly you're able to find something. Um, feel free to pipe in with questions, unmute, whatever you would like. I feel like we should have found some music for this section of it, Bob. What uh, were we that's thinking? That's probably true. I guess that's true. <laughs> Anybody that's here right. sing? Anybody Joe sing? Put a good thing in the chat. He says, "Get ready for your scavenger hunt." So we're going to give you that's ten right. minutes. It's ten twenty right now. Yes. We're going to give you five minutes. So ten twenty-five. Get going, folks. Perfect. <laughs> I won't torture you with me doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic idea. I love this. <laughs> I'm stealing this. <laughs> Do it. It was Bob's idea. He's great at this interactive stuff. Oh. You're right, Shannon. We could put music in here. Oh. Oh, see, somebody's Trish is fast. Good job, Trish. Nice, Trish. <laughs> Shannon, that's a den of ours, right? Yeah, ours. Is Janine, does that mean you just cheated? <laughs> we forgot the rule. You can't copy off the person that put theirs in before you. 
<laughs> was the person who talked about Gardasil yesterday. So. <laughs> Oh, I hope these I hope these texts or these chats are being recorded live here, John. Because keep your eye on your own student or your own paper. Yes. <laughs> Tonight I see that struggle in the Warren and Megan are already in the game. <laughs> Jessica, Isabella, everyone is chiming in. Okay, got two more minutes, folks. Awesome job. I'm impressed. Sarah, Isabella. Oh, someone pulled the, the sock hold one. Nice. Okay, one minute. I think at this point, if Kevin, Sarah, so I think we got. Yes. We get a, we got a reasonable amount. We can keep rolling. Lauren, we have all the students in, all plus right. faculty who are playing along at home. <laughs> Thank you, faculty. Okay, so. In the chat, I see, and I don't know, Bob, if you want to, you had this blank slide here. Do you want to type some of these in? Well, I was going to actually um, use the pen if I could. So, okay. What do we have? Whatever. We, have we have Gardasil. Yep, we have Gardasil. Okay. We have BCG. Okay. We have Verivax. Okay. Influenza, MMR, uh, that's the same one, polio inactivated, and then the polio sulk, which is also inactivated, but I think they're two different manufacturers here. Oh, they may actually be the same one, but that's okay. I think the last two came in about the same time. And I think that is what we have in the chat. Okay. And we'll like I said, and as the slide said, we're gonna come back to these in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you for playing along. <laughs> All right, so um, moving on. And the reason why we had you do the sort of the ingredient list is because what we hope to have you be able to do in about 30 minutes from now is figure out which type of vaccine or which active pharmaceutical ingredient you have in the vaccine that you picked. Now, um, guarantee, and David shared the slides that he, uh, that Dr. McNabb and Dr. Durdick used yesterday in their forum. And they mentioned a lot of these APIs uh, that range from inactivated virus, parts of inactivated virus or subunits, messenger RNA, adenovirus, yeast and lactic acid bacteria. And we've got them marked in terms of either mature technology or newer technology. Um, the inactivated virus and the parts of inactivated virus, they've been around forever. You had the Salk vaccine that somebody came up with. The messenger RNA and the adenovirus are interesting because we put a little asterisk with them. Like Shannon said, Bob Langer's group at MIT probably came up with the mRNA technology that's used to make the COVID vaccines for Moderna and Pfizer right now, two decades ago. Uh, it just never had any traction because there was never any need for the ability to manufacture something very quickly. Now, um, they are all manufactured differently. And if you go back to that comment I made about beer brewing and cell culture or fermentation when we first started this thing, all of these different APIs have at some step in the game, either a fermentation of a bacteria or a cell culture of a more advanced organism or cell type. The interesting pieces of the messenger RNA or the Pfizer or the Moderna 
And again, if you all have basic biology, you remember what transcription hopefully is. And if you don't, you'll see it in a little while when Shannon brings it up in large scale. Um, that is one of the key technologies for the manufacturing of the messenger RNA piece. And then parts of an activated virus, just I don't want to call it simple chemistry by no stretch of the imagination, but there's basically some chemical modification modifications that are done in terms of the subunit or the parts of inactivated viruses. Um, don't know if you guys can recognize the person in the corner, but that's Salk. And the inactivated virus is one of the, is the oldest one where you have that first step, you grow them, there's that culture again, and then you inactivate it with some type of heat and or chemical, and you eventually make it to the point where you've got an active material that you can inject in somebody. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this in particular because, and by no stretch of the imagination am I trying to detract from what Salk and his team came up with, but the equipment that I'm going to take you through in the next couple of slides are sort of what you would see on the news and you can get a feel then because this is sort of what the modern warfare material is when you're trying to make some type of vaccine. And uh, the reason why I'm not going to use the inactivated virus is because a lot of these equipment pieces aren't just used for those types of vaccines. The subunit or the part, I'm going to use a, whoa, uh, use uh, an example for um, a vaccine made for meningitis. The gentleman by Akshay Goel was a friend of mine that I went to graduate school and spent a lot of time with over the years. Uh, he went off to a vaccine manufacturing firm. And so he was responsible for making the active ingredient for um, a, a material that's actually used to deal with meningitis. 300,000 cases annually, 30,000 deaths. It's just a nasty, nasty thing that attacks your nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord. And so the active pharmaceutical ingredient for this thing is after this polysaccharide, which is here in the corner, which is this goofy little thing that if you had organic chemistry, you recognize it's something that looks like uh, the, the old bow tie conformation for something with an oxygen. Anyway, it's a big, long, ugly polymer. One of these units is this yellow dot here. And so this big, long polysaccharide is attached to a protein that's actually known to trigger an immune response in a person. And so we need to be able to purify this material and purify the tetanus toxoid protein as the carrier protein. So the subunit manufacturing step, you're gonna start counting on your fingers. Okay, folks? So the first thing that happens is somebody pulls something out of the freezer, step one. Working cell bank, is made and kept. That's sort of the stuff that you would pull from to actually do the fermentation because you've got the backup material and you've got the stuff that you actually are going to eventually work up into a gigantic fermentation. This thing right here, if you, uh, you know, a shameless plug for the engineering building, if you come by on the third floor, you can see some of these things in uh, our laboratories. Uh, they're just sitting off in the corner, glass vessels about this size. Next step. You're going to grow a culture in this thing. Next step, you're going to put it in a fermenter. This fermenter right here, the control screen that this um, person's looking at is about the same size as this one. So you can get a feel for the size of the fermentation system. This is about a 120 liter system, stainless steel. There's a motor down here at the bottom that stirs this thing about the same size as the horsepower on a 15,000 gallon swimming pool. You can imagine how hard it gets stirred. Uh, a bunch of vials, pipes, and things, and a big hook at the top to lift the top off with a crane. You end up harvest, you grow things up in this scale, you harvest it, and this is the actual polysaccharide, which is the GCMP. You use something called microfiltration. I've got a, two pictures of a microfiltration skids here. Again, to get yourself a sense of scale, there's a caster where my arrow is right now. That's about the size of a caster that you would see on the bottom of a, a chair or something like that. Bunch of pumps and pipes, these little leaf looking things. One of these is an ultra filtration, is a microfiltration cartridge. It's a filter, but it's a filter that's got some very specific properties that doesn't let things bind or stick to it. 
and let's liquid through so you can recover the solids and the liquids is two separate streams. Okay, so again, count the steps. One, two, three, four, five. And we've only done the upstream part. We only made the material. We'd like to be able to have something that's clean because you're not gonna directly inject meningitis that's been deactivated into your veins to try and pro provide an immune response. Next sets of steps, downstream, you take that liquid that comes off those filters. You send it through a special type of filter called an ultrafiltration filter that starts to separate things based on molecular weights. Everybody in this call probably knows the molecular weight of water is 18. The things that we're trying to separate are on the order of tens of hundreds of thousands at this step because we're trying to get parts of the polysaccharides away from all the rest of the crap that's in this cell-free culture that's just been in the tank that now has no cells in it anymore. There's some chemical derivatization steps that happen, dang it. It goes through yet another ultrafiltration membrane. And again, the, the whole thing for ultrafiltration is you pass liquid in, you have a barrier, you take liquid off that's um, a particular molecular weight cut off and then you reject the rest of it. Another chemical step, another filtration step, Another, fil uh, another chemical step, another filtration step, another filtration step. You can see that the ultrafiltrations are becoming smaller and smaller in size as you run through this particular process. Again, to get you an idea of how big that yellow bead-like string was that I showed you a few minutes ago for the polysaccharide on the initial chemistry step. No, and then you actually have the purified material. Not done yet, because this purified material that you've made in the tank has to be combined with something called tetanus toxoid protein, which also has another ultrafiltration step when you're trying to make it, because this is the protein that helps prime the immune system in an infant with this decorating the surface, so then they have protection against bacterial meningitis more chemistry, more filtration, more filtration, more formulation until you're finally done. And my buddy from grad school used to make this stuff all the time. And he was involved in the fermentation piece for the whopping 10 micrograms of the group C polysaccharide in a dose. And then that also went along with 10 to 20 micrograms of the tetanus toxoid protein that's used as the carrier material. A little bit of sodium chloride, a little bit of water, a little bit of aluminum hydroxide in order to stabilize the material while it's being shipped and um, stored. How many steps was that folks? The answer is greater than five. Each one of these steps, stainless steel, all kind of interesting little um, specific hardware like really nice tanks, really nice skids and really nice little tiny reactors that are all manufactured. The closest manufacturer for something like this is up in Springfield, Missouri. It's called Paul Mueller. They build these types of materials. The folks that make this particular type of skid is usually Millipore or somebody like that up in Boston. Okay, another exercise. Get your pencils and your calculators out. I want you to figure out how much tetanus toxoid or how much polysaccharide has to be made to vaccinate every child on the planet. This is not an easy calculation. I'm gonna give you five minutes at least to think about the calculation and then we're gonna show it to you because you gotta do a little bit of guessing. So five minutes to think about what you would need to calculate this amount. This one's for John, right? For the historians in the room? Yes. <laughs> Can I give my answer in pus? <laughs> sure. Anything you want. <laughs> Trish says I'm killing her. Yep. We've done our job as engineers. <laughs> I think that might have been John's comment about pus, though. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll give you. Two more, give you three more minutes to think about that.
You already did this math, right, Bob? I don't have to do it. Oh yeah, I did it. <laughs> Just making sure. Why is the check? <laughs> that would have started stalling. <laughs> and we'll come back to this one at the end. <laughs> we'll revisit it. What is it that our students usually say? I'll get back to you. That's right. My dog ate my homework, right? <laughs> Okay, folks, moving on. Okay, so these are random numbers that are dug off the web. They're gonna be order of magnitude close. And so if you actually look at WHO, they usually say there's about 20 births per year per thousand people on the planet. So if you take the number of people on the planet, 20 births per thousand people, 10 micrograms per dose, and then you ask Google to tell you the conversion factor between micrograms and pounds. You get about three pounds of active material needed per year or 1.5 kilograms roughly. So that sounds like not a whole lot of stuff, but you usually can only make about 1% of what you need in the systems that we just showed you picture wise. And this, by the way, would be O oh, every year. And so you're, again, the idea is to get a sense of scale here because you probably would need somewhere on the order of 100 to 200 batches per year just to fulfill this one drug or this one vaccine. And now start to even make it bigger because everybody, when we asked you to come up with different vaccines other than the one that cheated on Trisha's paper, there were seven different vaccines that were laid, that were already brought up. And so again, the whole point of this is to think about manufacturing, to think about scale, and to get an idea of the size of things that are involved here. Okay, Shannon, I think it's your turn next. It is my turn. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little more. This is probably overlapping a little bit with what was covered yesterday. So we'll try to breeze through some of this. Um, so I think most of us are aware by now that the vaccines that are approved for COVID-19 in the U.S. are either adenovirus, which is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, or an MRA um, vaccine, which is the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. And so I think, is this the one that's the same schematic they showed yesterday? Yes, so I stole okay. this with David and Janine last Perfect. night at 11 o'clock. It's funny because this is the schematic I was looking for and couldn't find. Um, so there are so many of them out there right now. So this is just a little demonstration of what's happening when you get the, the vaccine. I'm sure that David and Janine or Dr. McNabb and Dr. Durdick did a much better job yesterday explaining how all of this works than I would do. So trust me that we have these two types of vaccines. <laughs> um, I'm going to go through just a little bit on each of the types of vaccines. So the adenovirus vaccines, I actually pulled, I wanted to show two different adenovirus vaccines. So AstraZeneca is also an adenovirus vaccine. It hasn't Sorry. been approved, that's okay. It hasn't been approved in the US, but it is being used across Europe, um, Brazil, I believe, and in the UK. So um, viral vector vaccines, um, it, again, I'm not gonna go through how they actually work, but these are the two that are available, sorry. <laughs> take a deep breath and rethink what I'm doing. So the Johnson and Johnson or Janssen, who is the manufacturer that actually makes the vaccine. So if you heard Janssen, that's the same one. Um, it's a vaccine that's given into the muscle of the upper arm. It's one shot, right? So that's different than the other vaccines that we have available. One thing I wanted to focus in on this slide is this is the ingredients list. And what strikes me about the ingredients list is that this ingredients list is significantly shorter than that on my shampoo bottle, right? <laughs> and there are actually some similarities. Obviously, I don't have any recombinant adenovirus in my shampoo, I hope, although who knows, but I probably have citric acid in my shampoo. I probably have some sort of citrate, some sodium chloride, probably not ethanol in my shampoo, but there may be ethanol in some of the other hair products I use on my hair. Um, and so a lot of these things are kind of similar. This one down here, um, one thing I learned yesterday is that the FDA does an amazing job of giving us information, which is how I was able to pull these beautiful little boxes off of the packs, packets of information. The same thing doesn't happen in the UK and Europe. I couldn't find the beautiful information in the same way. So it looks a little bit different because I had to type it in. So the AstraZeneca is actually two shots. It's also an adenovirus, but they're doing it as two shot vaccine. 
Um, the reason it's four to 12 weeks apart, I believe that their testing was done at four weeks and it's possible that somebody else on this call knows that for sure. Um, but in the UK, they wanted to get one shot in as many people as possible first. So they've extended it to 12 weeks. Um, so between four and 12 weeks, you can get your, first sh uh, your shots, your second shot. This is also true, by the way, in some states in the US for some of our shots. So just a fun fact there. <laughs> um, it's also a shot into the muscle of the upper arm. Um, I think that's true for all of the COVID vaccines right now. And again, this is the ingredients list. It looks really overwhelming there, but on a, actually the, only the last two lines are the ingredients. The first part is all just telling you that it's an adenovirus that's included as the active, the API, the active ingredient in this. So just these few things at the bottom here, again, you see some common things, some sucrose, ethanol, sodium chloride, water, things that we see every day. I'm gonna get the hang of this right at the end. So this is how adenovirus vaccines are manufactured. So some of this was pulled from Biotechnology Journal. Um, basically, we start up here at the top with a master cell bank, go through the seed culture. Um, we then have a large cell culture and we infect that large cell culture. We go through some of those same steps that Dr. Beidel talked about already with the centrifugation and filtration to get a product. We then lyse the cells. Um, centrifuge again, do some chromatography, which is more filtration essentially, and, and get the product at the, at the end there as well. So we, we, it, when we compare this to the other, so I, I mean, it depends on how you count these steps. We have what, three, six, seven steps, Bob? Seven, eight, depends on how you count the infect step. <laughs> it's, we'll go with eight. Yeah. Okay, so eight steps. I counted 21 steps in the process that we discussed for the meningitis. So this looks like a lot less steps. Um, I would guess though, you can comment on this Dr. Beidel, but I'm guessing that these chromatography and centrifugation and filtration steps may have more than one step in there. Is that correct? It probably, maybe yes, maybe no, but there's certainly <laughs> not 31 to 25 steps involved. Right, right. So, okay. So this is the process that we go through for adenovirus manufacturing. Um, and that the biochemical engineers get to do a lot of fun stuff with. And let's quickly go through mRNA vaccines. Um, so the first two vaccines in the U that were approved in the US, both Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA vaccines, um, both shots in the upper arm. One is two shots 21 days apart. The other is two shots 28 days apart. Um, and again, I show the ingredients list here to show you that it looks, I mean, there's polyethylene glycol that's all over in our products, hair products, skin products, everything we use, um, sodium chloride, a lot of the same things that we normally see, but these lists are relatively short. And actually I said shampoo, but you know, I think this might be shorter than the list of ingredients on my ice cream container too. I could be wrong on that one, but <laughs> um, not a whole lot of ingredients going on there. Um, and it looks like Dr. Beidel has put the graph of our vaccination rates. Is this as of yesterday, May 11th, two days ago? Yep, this is the world numbers. Yep. So what are we at? 600 and it's, 60, uh, 666 million. Yep. Um, <laughs> four four percent fully vaccinated, eight percent one dose. Okay. That's not great news. Anyways, let's <laughs> um let's go through this manufacturing process and then we'll come back to that graph of how many people are vaccinated and tie it in with what we were talking about earlier. Um so this one, this one is really tiny. Yeah, that's the best I can do. <laughs> so we thaw the plasmids is the first step here. Um, and then, it went, Bob, I might have to have you go through this because I can't actually see. And then we cut the plasma. We have the enzyme cut the plasma, the DNA out, and it's put into, or it's transferred, sorry, it's translated, transcribed to mRNA. Yep. Um, and, then it's in, and then it's encapsulated into these lipid vehicles that are used to get it into our body and get it into our cells. Um, a couple important steps here. It kind of looks like the way we've written it, like there's not a whole lot of cell culture here, but if I'm not mistaken, this first step is, is cell culture, right, Bob? You are absolutely correct. So we create these plasmids in cells in a bioreactor, um, and then we purify them out. We can't see all the steps in this one. There are definitely purification steps in here along the way, either filtration or chromatography to clean everything up and make sure you're getting the right product into your body. Um, but this for like somebody in my field, this, this lipid nanoparticle enca encapsulating the RNA is like 
the real deal. <laughs> this is like the most amazing thing. Um, and I don't remember if this is on the slides that are coming after this. So I might, nope, I'm, it's not. So I'm not getting ahead of it. Um, the really cool thing here is this is something that we have been talking about in the, at my, the meetings I've been going to, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the American Chemical Society, Biomedical Engineering Society, all of these meetings, people have been presenting this stuff for like my entire academic career starting in grad school, right? This work has been going on for like 20 years and everybody has been talking about this and excited about this and nothing has happened until we had this like perfect storm of events come together so that we could use this technology that has been in the works for the last two decades. So yeah, it's really, really amazing. I have friends that have been working on little bits and pieces of this over the years. As I mentioned, Bob Langer, who is like top of the field in chemical engineering, biochemical engineering. Um, all of these people have been working towards this. There are some great stories out there and I'm sure some other people have shared them of you know, people that have spent their entire careers working on this technology and saying it's going to work, it's going to work and being told, eh, no, we don't really need it. But this was like perfect, right? We have this pandemic and the first thing we have available, you know, two months after the first, um, I guess it was even less than that after the first confirmed case of the virus, we had the whole sequence available and the sequence was put out online and available to the world. And all of these mRNA vaccine people said, oh my God, this is my moment. <laughs> this is where it all comes together. I have the sequence and I have the technology. And so the speed to get this out was 100% because it was 20 years in the making, right? 20 years that we've been working on these vaccines and perfecting the lipids, the lipid mixtures that encapsulate the mRNA. They've been perfecting all of the other um, ingredients that go into that for years. And the one thing they missed on that I think we all know by now is storage, right? Nobody thought it would be so fast to come out. And so nobody was worried about how we store these things um, until, until we realized we had to have a vaccine that was mass produced and sent out to the world essentially as fast as we could possibly get it out. So I maybe digress, but this is the really amazing part. You know, the, this is where I've been seeing people present this work for years and how this works and thinking, is this something we'll ever see make it out? And it is. So just a really cool moment for chemical engineers, biomedical engineers, the biologists, the chemists, everybody that have been a part of this. I think it's just a really amazing um, accomplishment that has, has happened with all of this. Did you want to add anything onto that before we go to the group exercise, Bob? <laughs> Just to reinforce what Dr. Servoz said, we're not implying that there's only five steps right. to making the messenger <laughs> RNA. Okay. Yeah. There is on the order of 20 steps. It's somewhere between the really detailed one for the meningitis that we took you through mm -hmm. and the adenovirus in terms of the number of steps. Right. Okay. Okay. So the next group exercise. Um, so go back to that vaccine you chose earlier and identify what type of vaccine is it? Um, I don't think we have yeah, this we have one on more slide. Yep. Well, we, okay, you do have it there, perfect. So you have the name, you have the manufacturer already, but what type of vaccine? Is it inactivated? Is it a subunit, adenovirus, mRNA, yeast, LAB? Um, there may be, if it's, if it's a protein vaccine, then it falls under that subunit one. Um, just because that's one that maybe some people will miss out on. And is there anything else you notice in the ingredient lists between the vaccine that you chose and the mRNA vaccine? We'll go to the mRNA one just because it's, so we only have to go to one slide. So I'm gonna go back to that slide so you can, you don't have to look up those. So there's the ingredient lists for the mm -hmm. mRNA vaccines. So if you can come up with what type of vaccine did you have and notice any differences in your ingredients list for your vaccine and these vaccines. And we'll give you about five minutes for that. So it's 10.52. Bob, don't you have some like Star Wars music on your phone or something? <laughs> if I can, I can just call you, right? I'll just keep calling you this whole time. <laughs> we'll get your ringtone going. There you go. 
you can feel free to put the stuff, anything that you find in the chat once you, you know, put the name of the vaccine you chose originally. So MMR and then what type of vaccine it is. Thank you, Lauren. We've got three there in the chat. Okay, we've got six in the chat there. We'll just give you a couple more minutes. Okay. All students are in the game at this point. Okay, awesome. All right, so I see some ingredients list there. So we have, we have BCG, let me go ahead if you wanted to write any of this stuff down. Well, actually, it, I think we're going to, everyone can see the chat, correct? Yeah, if we can just leave it there. Yeah, let's leave it there. Okay. There, there, were some neat, there were some neat things that I didn't expect them to pull up that we should probably describe. Okay, so BCG, which is the, I can, can never say this right. I'm going to have to look at the words while I say it. Um, Bacille Calmet Guerin which is a vaccine for tuberculosis, which is a lot easier to say, so I'll just keep with tuberculosis, um, is a live attenuated vaccine. So Bob, do you wanna explain what live attenuated is? It's mostly dead. <laughs> That's what I would have said too. I was hoping Bob was gonna have something really technical for us. <laughs> I know I should have called on one of the biologists. Um, <laughs> It's a mostly dead virus, right? So there is virus being injected. Um, okay, polio inactivated. And I see a few ingredients listed there. Not a lot though, right? Not a lot of ingredients. Um, is there inactivated virus? So basically they usually, it's a heat inactivation of the virus. Sometimes it's a chemical inactivation. Is that, does that ever happen for vaccines? The chemical inactivation, Bob? It, it does, but then they have to validate the chemical. Yeah, so I think it's usually heat inactivated. Um, MMR is another live attenuated vaccine. So similar to BCG. Um, important note here, fetal bovine, bovine serum is included in that. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Influenza is also inactivated. Um, so heat inactivated virus. Um, on the flu, I think most people know influenza vaccine, you get a seasonal flu vaccine, right? It's one of the reasons it's so hard to get a good flu vaccine is they have to culture all of that virus, the correct viruses and inactivate them. And they have to make a guess. How many months does it take, Bob, to manufacture a flu influenza vaccine? It's, I mean, oh. it's like four to six. Is that? Yeah. Longer? No. Okay. Yeah, four to six months. So they're usually taking from, so if we're creating a vaccine in the US, they're taking from the Southern hemispheres. What, what did they have going wrong with the influenza the year before? They use those variants and then um, in our vaccine and vice versa. Um, Verivax is active immunization. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, so I'm not sure, Bob, do you know more about active immunization? 
That phrase I am not familiar with. Okay. Okay, I see that, but yeah. I will look up here what exactly it is. It'll take me a few minutes. Um, and then polio again, inactivated. Um, okay, so a couple notes on ingredients. One thing that we note on the mRNA vaccines is there is no egg, there's no fetal bovine serum. And that's a kind of big deal. <laughs> um, there are a lot of people with egg allergies. And these days, there are a lot of people with the tick-borne um, disease where you can't, um, it's the alpha gale and I don't, I'm not a tick expert, so I can't tell you a whole lot about the disease other than I know that you can't eat red meat. And I know because when we had the issue on campus with MMR, that people that have that alpha gale dis disease fun dysfunction um, can't get the MMR vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> there were a whole lot of people that had to stay home because, or not a whole lot, but there were people that had to stay home because they couldn't get that. Um, so it's important that these mRNA vaccines that we're creating don't require any of those things that people are typically allergic to. There are a few ingredients um, that have some concern, but we have not seen any major outbreaks of, or any major allergic reactions to the vaccines. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to see if there's anything else in the, is there anything else on those, Bob, that you wanted to point out? I, just, I was like, I got the, the, so on the little cheat we got with no egg, mm -hmm. the tick-borne disease, that's the mm -hmm. part of the bovines. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then the, most of the ingredients, pretty much they're common stuff and they're usually there to stop from degrading. Mm -hmm. And to help it get yeah. into your cells. To help it get into your cells? And then the last thing to keep it from precipitating. Storage conditions. Okay. All right, ironically, Old Main is going off and we're right on time with what Linda said because we have about five more minutes and then we can mm -hmm. open it up for questions. Perfect. And we're gonna end with a bunch of silly photographs. <laughs> okay. So these are a bunch of silly photographs. And I would say that, you know, going back to the days of Sesame Street, one of, whoops, one of these things is not like the other. We've got a guy in the middle with the mug of beer. This is obviously a brewery in the middle. The other brewery is actually on the right-hand side because of the material that that brewer's setup that is actually set into the floor is made out of uh, not stainless steel, like the things on the left. The thing on the left is obviously something that probably someone's manufacturing a pharmaceutical because they got the hairnet and the lab coat and all that kind of fun stuff. And then that unit that's in the bottom is actually could go in either direction. You could either use that as a um, vessel to do the reactions that we had spoken of earlier and um, or actually a fermentation itself. Someone threw something in the chat, let's see. That was me. Oh, okay. I looked it up, Varivax is an attenuated virus vaccine. Got so it. It's a live attenuated. Okay. Other random pictures, we can make it advance. <laughs> um, again, those filtration setups, just to remind you of the size and maybe take it back to something that some of the students could have seen in their laboratories. Upper right-hand corner is the core active piece of a small ultrafiltration device. You would put the liquid in there and it's about, you can see it's a, it would hold about 200 milliliters, 100 milliliters. You put a membrane in the bottom, you put pressure on it and you squeeze the liquid out and you keep the stuff of a certain molecular weight cut off behind the membrane and the material leaks through. The scale up version of that thing is right next to it, one of the little skids. Again, you can see the wheels and the control panels and the big buttons. The actual cartridges for the filtration are these one, two, three, four little things here. And there's about four or five square foot in each of those things to do the filtration and the plumbing and all that stuff to get the liquid, the concentrate and the permeate back and forth. 
Um, when Shannon went over the messenger RNA and the uh, liposome combination step, this bank of things that these two folks with the blue hard hats are in front of, those are all high pressure pumps that, what is it, 400 PSI, I believe? Is that the at number? Least, at least 400, yeah. So when the messenger RNA and the lipids get um, combined, it's under a lot of pressure. And the HPLC pumping system is what's actually used to get all that stuff mixed. The thing in the middle is a large chromatography column that's about a foot and a half in diameter. And if you look back in the corner, you can see a couple columns that if you walked into Suresh Kumar, David McNabb, Bob Beidel's laboratory, this is about the scale of the stuff that we have in Shannon's laboratory too. And then this last item is a chromatography column that's been converted into a fish tank. And this is actually in Springdale, Arkansas. <laughs> Did now diagnostics. That's where I did my sabbatical in 2019-20. So that's the fish tank that I walked past every day. <laughs> so, where are chemical engineers involved in vaccine manufacturers? We're pretty much everywhere. You know, we're the coolest engineers on all planets. We understand the components, the math, and then the biology. And our unique piece in this whole puzzle is to figure out how to scale it up to deal with the needs for the capacities. And we're going to leave two cartoons on the screen and start opening up for questions, John. All right. Oh, those are good. <laughs> Thank you. This was incredibly informative. And now when I cut through Bell in the rain, I will feel like I know much more of what I'm seeing. <laughs> so, let me just see, we had some very good questions for today, some of which are very on point about things we talked about today and some more general questions. And we've been giving space for those more general nagging questions that everyone has out there. Uh, and I want to start with one of those general ones. Uh, oh, John, John? Yes. Before you start into the questions, um, Janine and David, if you're still online, feel free to chime in if Shannon and I need a little help. Yes, please. <laughs> so um, Lauren Malty has a question about refrigeration. Lauren, if you wanna unmute and ask your question. Yes. Um, so I read from one of the readings that vaccines are um, half of half of vaccines are wasted annually because they are not kept cold. So I was just wondering if a person is to receive an unstable vaccine, what could happen? You want to take that first? So, yeah, I mean, I can say what would happen to the vaccine itself. Um, so if it's not refrigerated, it depends on what type of vaccine it is, but um, there's a good chance that the active components that your body creates an immune response to will no longer be available in their correct structure, right? So, so let's say that there's, you know, a protein on the surface of the virus, it has a very specific structure and way that it's folded. If it's stored at higher temperatures for too long, that structure will start to unfold. Um, and then what your body creates antibodies to would not be the same as what it would see if you were exposed to the virus. So using flu as an example, um, if it unfolds, you have antibodies to that unfolded protein, but when you get infected with the flu virus, the protein that it sees do not look the same as that protein and the antibodies may not work against it. Bob, does that cover that's, one part of it? That's, that's the, that's the, the biology and the biochemistry piece. Yeah. The only thing that I would add to that is this is the whole reason why the doses get thrown away that have not been refrigerated properly or stored properly or um, are wasted at the end of the day because not enough people have signed up to get the vaccine. Those vials that you see that show up on TV, when they get pulled out of storage, they have a certain amount of time and you've got to get rid of them at the end. So you don't have people who aren't vaccinated in the way that 
the drug was intended for and all the studies were done to make sure that it's gonna work if you keep it at a particular temperature and you don't abuse it. Mm. So it's better to throw it away. And, and I'll add to that, that, you know, it's it, all of the recommendations for refrigeration and storage were based on the initial tests that were done between let's say May and September of 2020. Um, Pfizer in particular has been working really hard to see how stable their, vi their vials of uh, vaccine really are. And they are much more stable than they originally thought. So um, I think we've already seen some changes approved by the FDA to the storage conditions. And I think that's going to continue without any changes to the ingredients, just because we were in such, I mean, I don't wanna use the word rush, but we were, we were in a rush, right? We wanted people to start getting vaccines in arms and especially for those medical workers and healthcare workers. So we, um, the, it was approved with a set of conditions that they absolutely knew would work. And the studies continue to make sure that that we can maybe loosen that a bit. And David, you may know, is it minus 20 for, for Pfizer now, or is it just a length of time that changed? They've uh, applied to FDA for approval to move to minus 20. I, I don't know if it's reached final approval yet, but they have submitted the data showing their vaccine is still okay. is stable at minus 20, yes. Okay. All right. Isabella Stark has a follow-up question on other barriers and boundaries in vaccine development that we're learning about. Isabella, you want to unmute? She's having diffi mic difficulties, so she asked if you could read her question. I will be glad to. She says, beside cold storage, are there other boundaries in the development and transportation of vaccines that have yet to be overcome? Or maybe what other boundaries have we overcome in the process of developing and, vac and stabilizing vaccines for their increased mobility? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll take a cop-out answer and take a stab at this. Ask Ashley in three days. <laughs> I, that's what I was gonna say too. I think that when you guys cover supply chain, you'll, there'll be a lot more um, that they can talk about there. So we've got questions about waste. And there's another question that's a little more supply chain. So um, a Kevin, question from Kevin Liu on the UMass article. Hi, um, yes. Um, the question is, uh, if the problem is keeping the vaccine cold, why is it so difficult? And I understand now it's uh, just uh, because of accessibility to cold storage, but uh, how has this, uh, how much effect has this problem affected our count on current vaccinations? So I can take a first stab at that if you want, Bob, or go for it. Okay. Um, so I can campus. I'm sorry. I can go, I can finish up with campus. So yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the, with the cold storage, I mean, yes, the biggest issue is accessibility. And, and the biggest issue there was, you know, the first vaccine that was approved was a mm -hmm. Pfizer vaccine, which required minus 80 storage. So I don't know about you guys, but I don't have a minus 80 in my home. Um, and I have one on campus and anybody else that has one on campus knows what a pain it is to keep them up and running. They are, they are very persnickety beasts. Um, they have a two condenser system. Generally, there are different types, but the most standard minus 80s that you're going to find have a two condenser system or two compressor system, sorry, two compressor system that brings it down to first around minus 50 to minus 55. And then the second compressor brings it all the way down to minus 80. That's a lot of equipment. It takes a lot of juice. If the power goes out and my minus 80 is on the same circuit as anything else, the whole circuit blows when the power comes back on because it takes up so much power to get it restarted. So minus 80s are not a minor thing. Um, we were very lucky in Fayetteville, I will say, that we had pharmacies in the community. Um, I'm pretty sure the city of Fayetteville purchased at least a couple minus 80 freezers with their funds. I know um, Collier's purchased some minus 80s. We were really lucky in our community, I will say, that we had such access to minus 80 freezers. Um, there are many communities that didn't have that sort of access. And so, um, you know, Collier's, for example, they only have one of their pharmacies that has the minus 80. So then they would have to pull out a certain number of vials, take it to another pharmacy, and then those vials had to be used within X amount of time from being pulled out of the minus 80. 
Um, so those are really where the, the trouble comes in with cold storage is that, you know, it's accessibility, it's transporting it, it's how long is it good from the moment you take it out of the freezer. So you couldn't say pull one out of the freezer and then drive it to Magnolia, Arkansas from Fayetteville and get much use out of it. Um, Bob, you want to continue that or? It's funny that it's funny that these two questions are actually coupled mm -hmm. and it goes with the FDA approval because it's one thing to buy the freezer you have to prove that the freezer works hmm. right? in order to be uh, considered for storage in the first place. And so there's actually another level of accessibility that goes there also, because you just can't pull a, you can't, you can't pull a minus 80 off of eBay or something like that, and then get a box of syringes and open up your own vaccine clinic. Um, you're going to have to do a little bit more than that and make sure that the equipment is validated for storage. Excellent. Sarah Armstrong has a question about difficulties with enveloped viruses. Yeah, so this was briefly touched on in the UMass reading, but I was curious if you could go more in depth as to why exactly complex coacervation, if I'm saying that right, doesn't work for enveloped viruses. Now I'm gonna have to look that, make sure what that word is that we're, did you, Bob, do you have this or no? Do you want me to? No, I'll be honest with you. I didn't read the article. <laughs> Faculty are just horrible people, all of us. <laughs> I did read the article. Do we, can we take another question and I'll look at that though? Sure. Uh, Jessica, you had a question about mRNA manufacturer that might take us back to talking a little bit more about the lipids. Um, yeah, my I asked, um, does the new technology that was used to create the successful mRNA COVID vaccines make mass manufacturing of the vaccinations even more difficult than the prior vaccines? So maybe you can say a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, got it. Okay, I can, I can probably take a stab at that to begin with. So the, the short answer is no. I can think of no, and this is also, um, I'm saying this from the standpoint of watching the news, reading the news, you know, reading the news, and then keeping in contact with some of the folks that we've got that are alumni that actually work at Pfizer and uh, Merck and a couple of other places. There really hasn't, the, the, the one, the, the things that were short on the supply chain are, not so much the reagents, because when you make the messenger RNA from the DNA, you're doing um, laboratory experiments in the reverse trend. You, you basically are using the same technology that you would see in any of the laboratories, either the Vital Lab, the Servos Lab, the McNab Lab, the Jurdic Lab. But um, there, there actually was a concerted push for the folks that were supplying those materials to us for research purposes, we started getting notes that made perfect sense that says, your order's not gonna be filled for two months. We're putting your research on hold so we can go ahead and make the vaccines. Still getting those messages, by the way, just to be clear. <laughs> it, it's a, it, you, you could, it depends on the way you wanna define shortage because they made the wise decision to shift the supply chain towards where it actually was needed for health, public health response. Now, the silly part is you'd be surprised, but there was a point uh, about three or four months ago where the talk around Northwest Arkansas was not so much as being able to get the vaccine supply, but getting the syringes that were needed in order to stick in your arm. And so there literally was a contingency plan for some of the folks that are on this phone call to donate, you know, several crates of syringes that are in the laboratories around here that are sterile and they've been validated and all that sort of stuff to, they never had to do it, but plan was there. So was the question about the storage of the vaccines that what the difference is between current previous vaccines and this vaccine? I thought that's what I heard, but I might've misunderstood that. 
Well, we've had a couple questions in that area. Is there a question you wanted to answer? Yeah, there was. So what I was going to say is one of the big differences between this particular vaccine, the, the RNA, and, and to a certain extent the adenovirus, but mostly the mRNA vaccines, and our you know attenuated live virus or the inactivated virus vaccines is that the the lipid structures that are formed these from these synthetic lipids are much less stable than the virus than viruses themselves and so there's a um it, it's easier to break them apart and i don't know i mean i've worked with lipids for quite a few years and they're just really sensitive materials <laughs> um they they they're, they're based on an equilibrium situation. And so when you, you know, have them at warmer temperatures, they can fall apart with time. And so there's a lot that has to go into making sure that they're stable and that they can. Oh. I think we have frozen Shannon. We'll give her a second to free up. Can everyone else hear me? Someone will give me a thumbs up. All right. Um, all right. Well, we're, Unsticking Shannon, <laughs> frozen talking about freezing. Sarah, you had another good question about manufacturing and ingredients. Yes, thank you. So um, what recommendations would you give besides using more naturally occurring proteins to more easily facilitate vaccine manufacturing and or maintenance? And which do you view as the larger obstacle? Oh, I think I finally am back on. Okay, you're here. Okay. I don't know where I left off, but apparently I have an, inter an internet issue right now. So basically the lipids are more, are more easily broken down than, um, than a virus itself is what I was trying to get at. I'm not sure where I cut off though. So I'm sorry mm -hmm. for that. <laughs> Sarah, you want to repeat your question? Repeat yes, it. I will. Um, read it a little slower, please. Okay. Yes. So what recommendations would you give besides using more naturally occurring proteins to more easily facilitate vaccine manufacturing and or maintenance? And which do you view as the larger obstacle? Well, let me, I, let me make sure I understand the question correctly. So you're, you're asking really whether or not the manufacturing of the vaccine or I'm, I'm missing the, I'm, I'm sort of missing the point of the question because let me, let me go ahead and. Maybe... Is this, is this in reference to the UMass article? Yes, kind of okay. both um, because there were discussions of like manufacturing issues that also correlated to lack of other supplies that like you said, might tie more into the supply chain management lecture. But then it also talked about maintenance such as like um, using complex coacervation or cold um, to keep them in use for a while. So on the complex coacervation, I did have time to look at that. Um, and so what, what they're saying is that it doesn't work well for viruses that have a lipid or fatty layer around them because the materials that they use in the coacervation, the, the, the things they add to the mixture break down that layer, right? And so it wouldn't work well for many of the viruses that are in vaccines and it also wouldn't work well for these mRNA or adenovirus vaccines because they're essentially, they're similar to an enveloped protein or an enveloped virus, the material on the outside is. Um, and so what they're trying to do is develop new ways to, or new materials to form that environment that won't break down the lipid layers. Does that make any sense at all, Sarah? I'm sorry, that's a lot of big words in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Thank okay. You. <laughs> um, and then Bob, do you want to take the other manufacturing stuff or did that already get covered? I'm not sure. I think you may have, maybe. Okay. okay. Let's, let's, let's put it this way. Sarah, did Dr. Servos answer your question? <laughs> Cause I'm still, yeah, a little, thanks. still a little confused by it, honestly. All right. We have a few minutes left. So I'd like to say, um, other members of the university community, if you have questions or comments or students, if you'd like to ask a question from the presentation and not from the readings, now's the time, feel free to either unmute and ask directly or to put it in the chat. And I was, as people are thinking, I was very happy. The main thing I 
felt responsible for in that last experiment. I remembered how to do all the conversions of the unit sizes. There you go. <laughs> So uh, does anyone else want to get in here, including faculty, if people have other questions or comments? And students, is there anything that you'd like to ask based on this incredibly informative presentation? Everyone's feeling very shy today, I see. We could talk about beer. Well, hey, we could talk Your about beer. Beer is the coming thing. I think that was one of the. I think that was one of the Trappist breweries you were showing a picture of. <laughs> Judging from the design and the stained glass in the background, which are always great favorites of mine. But where do you see? Just as we talk, we're talking about our flagship mission always, and the two of you are intimately involved in innovation and research at the university. Where do you see the U of A's role in the future of projects like this? Uh, and obviously we've turned out some great scientists who are working on it. I'll make a, I'll make a comment. Um, I don't remember the total grant count, but there's probably half a dozen, maybe a dozen grants that have been specifically brought to the university to combat some aspect of COVID-19. Um, Shannon and I actually have an NSF grant to manufacture standards for all of the materials that need to be um, done for the diagnostic piece. There are people on this campus that have, uh, that are working on little widgets like she and I are to people that are doing the, the supply chain stuff to figure out how to distribute it quickly, fast, and that sort of business. Uh, Quick plug, there's also a project on campus that I'm a part of where we are doing a seroprevalence study. So if you get an email that looks a little bit like a spam in your box saying, please schedule an appointment at the union so we can draw your blood and see if you have antibodies, go sign up. <laughs> I don't think That'd we're be. full yet. <laughs> I, I signed up for it. I was on the list. They wouldn't let me sign up. <laughs> the, um, the, and that, that's, that's a, that's a beautiful shameless plug for biology. Wasn't that, and, yeah. Yeah. And, sciences and chemical engineering working together because that's. And, and just industrial. Sheng Fan is part of that project as well, who I think is speaking later this next week. Uh, we have a question on the chat yes. from Jamie Walker. Where did the 21 and 28 day time periods come from with regard to the second <laughs> vaccine? David, do you have a great answer for that? Because I don't have a great answer. Oh, I got a, I got a great, you have a, you have a, I got a great sarcastic answer for me it. too. I'm trying to avoid those for a moment. David might have like a great scientific answer. <laughs> we like sarcasm over here in Gearheart. So I don't know the facts, but I suspect this was the each company's individual choice during it phase was. at phase one clinical trials, they set this up. They probably looked at multiple choices early on, and this is what each of them found for their individual vaccines was the best timing uh, to go forward. So it was probably worked out in the clinical trials early in the clinical trials, phase one trials and they established these numbers. And then when they wrote their protocol to get approved to go to phase three, you have to stick with the protocol that you set up. So that means when you go to distribution, emergency use, you, you have to stay with the, what you have proven worked in your phase three trials. You do not get to substitute McCormick oregano for Great value oregano or any exactly. Exactly. Any, any any of the FDA things. There there is when you if you get approved for 21 days, because what David said with regard to they probably had data for 21 days, it's 21 days. So Period. the the caveat to that, of course, is that the CDC can then make their assessment and determine. And so you've probably seen that the CDC says 21 days to 
is it seven weeks, eight weeks? They give a different timeline. Yeah. I don't remember the, the end point on theirs, but they say anywhere similar to the UK, they say anywhere between three weeks for Pfizer or four weeks for Moderna out to something like eight to 12 weeks. I can't remember what it is. Um, and they then, oh, go ahead, go ahead. David. They, they certainly don't want people, if you miss the 21 days, you can still go back and get the second one. Absolutely. So please, please don't say, oh, I screwed up. I can't get the second dose. That's what they're trying to avoid. You still can get the second dose and it will work. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the sarcastic answer is that, you know, really they, when they were in phase one trials, which was possibly most likely before it was even a COVID vaccine, they picked those days. And when they realized they had to move things forward quickly, they stuck with those days so that they could get it done quickly. Yep. My guess is when the final FDA approval happens, they will have a range on that as opposed to a single date. Does anyone have one last quick question? Because we're coming. I have a quick question for the students. I'm going to butt in, John. Go for it. You all know what the Cell and Molecular Biology Program is at the University of Arkansas? Raise your hands in the participant if, thing if or you, somehow. If you do great. If you don't, take a look on the website because... I did notice that the collection of um, what I would call the usual suspects that are in this vaccine forum have something to do with the cell and molecular biology interdisciplinary program at the university. So yet another shameless plug, John. We have, a, <laughs> we have a great range in this class of public health, chemical engineering, nursing, biology, and I'm missing one. So we're coming at the problem from all angles. And I'll make the second plug um, for Shannon so she can give me my free antibody test. That's right. <laughs> uh, today is another great piece of evidence for just how important research is and particularly undergraduate research is at the university for all students, honors, non-honors, whatever your field, being a researcher changes your life and your perspective. And we would like to thank our Super fine examples of fully grown researchers today. Um, Vice Chancellor Vidal, Professor Servas, this was an excellent introduction into the world of chemical engineering and vaccines. And I think we're all leaving a lot smarter and very grateful. Students, be sure to turn in for tomorrow's class which is going to be a great walkthrough of understanding vaccine efficacy and effectiveness from the statistician's perspective. So off to yet another field after two days of getting some solid science under the topic, and we will look forward to seeing what we learn tomorrow. Thank you to everyone on behalf of Dean Kuhn who joined in today. We will see you at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.